Uh, I hope you all had enough caffeine, either tea or coffee or a Coke after, after lunch. Oh, we have got some funny colors now. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's see. So it seems that the demo gods are already using up all their, all their might up front so that later on we'll have fewer issues. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, how our software that we built actually can use uh, much more often for doing good. And this is mostly by enabling people who are not developers, who are working in other fields, and try to kind of move mankind forward uh, to use the, the stuff that we built. And um, in, in my case, it was kind of a, came to a surprise to us ourselves as well that um, those uh, journalists used uh, Neo4j as one of their tools, and I want to talk a bit about the journey today. But first of all, uh, please don't forget to rate this talk, and um, make sure to pay attention, don't fall asleep, don't snore too loud. Um, my name is Michael, uh, and I'm working for Neo4j as a kind of caretaker of the community. I make sure that every developer who uses Neo4j is happy and successful, and it's kind of a lot of fun. Today, the topic is Panama Papers, uh, which, who of you hasn't heard of the Panama Papers? Let's see. Oh, a few. So for most of you, I don't have to explain what it is. Uh, but in, uh, in general, it's the, uh, one of the largest data leaks that came out of a law firm out of Panama, Masak Fonseca, um, that described or contained data since the 1970s about all the clients they had, about all the shell companies they created, how money uh, moved from, from the rich countries to the shell companies and back again. And um, so unearthing all these secrets and these connections was something that was enabled by this uh, huge data leak. Uh, let's start with a disclaimer. Uh, there's, in theory, nothing wrong with having a shell company. Who of you has a shell company? No. Um, so uh, that's just a general disclaimer because no one wants to get sued. Um, the company, uh, sorry, the the, uh, the group of uh, journalists that investigated these uh, uh, these papers uh, is called the ICIJ, the Investigative Journalists uh, Consortium, and it's kind of an interesting kind of a journalist. It's not a traditional journalist that just reports on like the. Uh, cat of the neighbor on a tree or something like that, but they do really a lot of data work. So they get huge amounts of data, they do deep investigations, they are also quite technical in many cases, and they sometimes work on a project for a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years. Sometimes they have like pet projects that they follow up on and dive really, really deeply into it. And sometimes they even risk their lives during the investigations because they have like covered uh, investigations uh, and so on. And so the ICIJ is about uh, 200 journalists uh, out of 50, uh, 65 countries, and they already published quite a number of, of leaks in the past. Most of them were quite kind of tiny and nonetheless quite interesting, but recently the Panama Papers was quite, um, quite uh, impressive, and just two weeks ago they published a new one, which is called Bahamas Leaks. And interestingly, when I flew into Copenhagen, I had this... Um, Holland Herald uh, from KLM, which depicted one of the uh, heroes of Dutch politics, uh, Neely Kroos. And um, actually, if you look at it, um, she was always, so she was EU commissioner uh, for a lot of um, com company transparency uh, issues and, and other things that was all about being honest and staying honest. And she always said, of course, I would never do stuff like that. And then in the Bahamas leaks, actually her name cropped up and then uh, when she was confronted with it, she actually um, said, it's, yeah, it's nothing and don't worry. And, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, even the, the kind of topmost politicians are not uh, safe from being discovered because humans, even if we try to hide, hide our tracks, we still leave traces, right? So, and even the hiding of the tracks can leave traces, which then are forming patterns which you can discover in data again. So, be sure... Uh, to not do something like that, because after all, at some time, uh, it will come out. And uh, because the introduction can be done much better than uh, I doing it by 
the idea check looks like. So I'll show you this video. I still get goosebumps when I see this video. Okay, where's my PowerPoint? Um, so we, come on. Um, so we are looking at a lot of data here, and the journalists really uh, never met this person. They no, don't know who she, he is. They even destroyed all their phones and laptops that they had any conversation on with, and uh, they went to really to the extreme to make sure that it's never discovered where the data came from because it's uh, very, very dangerous. And uh, they also put up a, a lot of effort in, in protecting this data when they started uh, to look into this quite huge amount of data. Um, they said, okay, Süddeutsche Zeitung is a medium-sized uh, German newspaper, right? So they can't solve something like that on their own. They only have like two or three investigative journalists and even they got support from their, uh, from their management, but they, they said, we can't do it alone. So they were looking for partners, and the ICIJ was one of the partners that they, they went for. They showed him some of the samples of the data, and then they said, okay, let's do that together. And what they actually did is they formed a group of almost 400 journalists working for a whole year in secrecy on this data. So you have to imagine, 400 people who actually usually are used to report stories must not tell anyone, not even their own families, what they're working on. No one, not the people whose software they use, not the people that they usually work with. It's always just, we're working on something, I can't tell you anything, right? So, and that was a really um, big challenge. They even built their own uh, uh, encrypted communication tools uh, to exchange information. And they also uh, used a, a large stack of software to work with this uh, data. And was, what is most impressive to me is that this whole effort was supported by a data team of only six people and three of them being software developers. So three people supporting 400 journalists who are non-developers in working with this huge amount of data I think is quite impressive. A breakdown of the data, a lot of emails, a lot of uh, database records, and a number of scanned documents and, and uh, PDFs. And... Um, the approach that they took was pretty straightforward, something that we would all do, right? So uh, turn the scanned images back into text, uh, extract the metadata, so who created the documents, when were they created, which email was sent by whom, to whom, with which subject, so all the metadata that you usually have, and take both the metadata and the data and put it into a database to make it available for the journalists to, to research and to uh, investigate, right? And uh, the data, uh, scanning was a problem initially, but then they got um, a free license from Nuix, which is a high volume uh, OCR company. And so they put it onto 35 service on AWS, and it took only uh, almost two weeks to, to scan all the documents. So then they had kind of the text. And in the next step, uh, they used a modified version of Solar, of Apache Solar, um, to allow journalists to search for text occurrences, right? So they had like names or fragments of names or um, certain indications of companies and so on. And they extended it with some additional features like batch search and user management and, and things like that. And then they could kind of get the first glimpse or, or glimpse on the data. Uh, but then it was still, they were still looking at kind of disconnected of pieces of information, right? A document here, an email there, a, a database record there, but it was still non-connected. So um, in the next step, actually, they uh, put it all together and created all the relationships and connections. So this is, again, the stuff that they did for the extraction. They also did their own uh, Python scripts and, and used Tesseract and so on uh, for the text extraction and entity recognition. 
And uh, to connect all the stuff together, they actually used Neo4j. And uh, on top of Neo4j, a, a tool called Linkures by one of our partners, um, which they also got uh, for free, which is uh, a JavaScript library based on Sigma.js, which allows you to take data out of Neo4j database and um, make it available to users in a really comfortable, comfortable manner so that even people with no technical background that just see the, the, the arrows and the circles can work with this data. So they can search in the database with that. They can navigate. They can um, edit and add data as well. Um, so for them, it was quite a, quite a nice tool uh, to use. Um, so which enabled them in the end to publish all the stories that we've seen worldwide in all these, uh, all these newspapers. If we look at the data again, uh, as I said before, it's actually disconnected documents, right? So we have some uh, emails, we have some documents, we have some people, we have some companies, but we don't know what it actually means that we have these pieces of information. But um, if we add context in, in form of relationships between all these things, then suddenly it makes sense, right? In this case, we have someone who's supported by another person whose mom actually, or who's, yeah, whose mom created a company which this person owns shares in, and so they can actually use this kind of shell company to transfer money uh, from A to B without the actual supporter of this uh, negotiator uh, being in the loop at all, right? So it's a really nice uh, scheme where you um, move uh, people that kind of interact one or more steps apart, and because they are several steps apart, it's much harder for investigators uh, to find these connections, right? Because it, because it could be like 10 companies in between until you have actually the people that kind of where the influencer and the influenced are uh, holding together. It's also something that you see today quite nicely if you look at the um, FAC campaign data and the US uh, election donation, how money flows through all these channels and um, quite interesting. And so when you put uh, this information that you had individually before into context, then it makes so much more sense. And then suddenly the stories emerge and you see how does all the individual documents that we got relate, how do, do they belong together, and how, um, how do we uh, look at these. Um, something that an investigative journalist uh, does so is not just taking this for granted, the data that comes from a leak, but they kind of take these just as hints or suggestions, and then they don't do their own independent research to confirm these, these facts as well. Because otherwise, you rely on a single source where you don't have kind of proof, actually, that it's coming from there or that it's not been tampered with. Uh, and so you have to have secondary um, research going on that proves, actually, that um, uh, this information is true. But then what you find in your investigations, in your own investigations, you can add back to this uh, connected data set, right? So all the new insights that have not been in there, you can add back into this data set and make it available for your colleagues to use as well. And actually, it's not just true for journalistic and investigative work, but it's true for everything. So everything in our world is actually connected information. There's no such thing as a disconnected piece of information. Be it in, in politics, in history, where events relate to, to people and to uh, to other events in the past, to cities, to locations, and so on. If you look at companies and markets, if you look at the financial markets, how quickly a, um, a recession is started by a single event somewhere, and it triggers and explodes over all the things. I mean, you saw this morning in Raphael's uh, uh, and Andrea's uh, presentation on how combined systems influence each other and how quickly it can get out, out of control. Um, but also in science, so for instance, if you look at the genome or a protein, it's a highly connected data structure as well, right? Or the brain, uh, for that matter. And of course, in IT, uh, if you look at um, physical networks, the servers that are connected by these physical networks, the virtual servers, the applications that run on these, and the users that use these applications, all form networks uh, of, on the different layers on a, on a stack, right? And um, software as well. Software is also just a gigantic graph. And, of course, criminal behavior also forms uh, connected uh, information or graphs because, as I said before, you can't try to hide your tracks, but you, can st you still leave patterns. And if you take a step back, you see these patterns that, that people left. Right? So we see it everywhere. Actually, uh, on every piece of marketing material that we see today, anywhere you see connected information. Right? So it's kind of really funny how it uh, went to every place in our life. So we need a database to store this connected information, and so the journalists uh, chose Neo4j. There's actually nowadays a plethora of graph databases out there, so if you 
uh, for any reason want to use uh, a different graph database, you're free to, to do that. And uh, it's, um, actually, it's really nice that kind of the choice also drives uh, evolution and progress in, in this area. Uh, just some words about the basic data model of, the, of a graph database, which is really simple because it's the same data model that you would use or what you, ha you would have when you draw data on a white or uh, information on a whiteboard. Right? Imagine you're discussing a problem with a colleague or a friend. You grab a whiteboard and start drawing circles and arrows right? to explain something, have an example of something. And so what the graph model does is actually it takes this information from the whiteboard and, and puts it in the computer. So we keep the circles, which we call nodes, where you can attach any kind of information, which are kind of the entities of your domain, and then relationships which connect these uh, nodes, which have a type and direction, and I can also attach any kind of information. Usually it's something like distance, costs, or weights, or something like that. So uh, that's kind of the basic model, and that's, as you can imagine, as it's uh, also schema-free, so it's very flexible, so I can put as much or as little information as I have on an, uh, on an entity on it. So for instance, I could have a shell company where I only have a name, and I could have another shell company where I have all the company's history, all the, all the um, dates when it was founded, when it was uh, disbanded, the, all the shareholders, the, the amount of money it has, the location, and so on. Right? So depending on the data that I got from, from the different sources, I can have a lot of information on each entity or just a little of, uh, bit of information. And uh, Neo4j was originally built in, in Sweden um, to in Malmö, actually just across uh, the Earthland. Um, to solve uh, some tricky problems. One was cross-language search uh, for, for tech documents, and the other one was a complex a ACL resolution in a, in a SaaS software, So which they couldn't solve with a relational database, so they built their own thing, because how hard can it be to build a database, right? Uh, we all know that. And um, so over the years, so that was in the early 2000s, and over the years uh, it evolved, and as an open source project, has been around since 2007. And it's a real-time database, so like relation databases, uh, transactional, and you can also set it up in larger clusters if you want to. Used for many things, but in journalist case, it was mostly kind of fraud detection and graph-based search for they, what they used it for. And if you look at it, uh, the data that I have on my whiteboard, um, if I put it into the, the graph and visualize it again, it stays exactly the same. So that means I'm also not losing the people that I usually would lose because uh, in a relation database or that another database, you don't see your domain for tables anymore, right? So it's all, um, all just tables. And here, you can even take along everyone who comes from, from the business and take that. And what we really want to do in, in these graph databases is keep these patterns that we are really good at as humans to recognize and to work with, to keep it all the way long. You saw it now that we have it in the, in the visualization, on the modeling, and um, in the conceptual model, but we also wanted to keep it in the, in, the, in the query language. So what we did is we looked at many different query languages, but didn't find anything that was really cool. So we used ASCII art, which means you turn circles into something that's surrounded by round parentheses, and use uh, arrow, uh, ASCII art arrows to um, represent relationships which means the queries that I write uh, still contain all the patterns that I usually have on my whiteboard. So that means that also people that have no background in databases whatsoever can understand these queries and reason about them, which makes it really uh, suitable for, for use uh, with um, non-technical people. And we can use these patterns to find data and also to create data. So I won't bore you with the, with the data uh, query language, but it's, as you can see, it's all about these patterns, right? These patterns are in the middle, and then all the other stuff is just in another, like in another database, where you can uh, filter, um, aggregate, and and um, and paginate this information. Um, if you want to load this data in, so for instance, um, the ICIJ published the database, the database as well, so everyone can actually access the, the files uh, online. Uh, I'll show you in a second how. Uh, so it's a large set of CSV files that you can get, uh, but you can also get it as a uh, ready uh, made Neo4j database that you can just download and run directly. But if you get the CSV files, they um, can be imported directly into Neo4j with an importer. So this is kind of the CSV files. I have companies, people, addresses, and relationships down here. And so if I take them, I can import them directly with the tool into Neo4j, and uh, it's actually pretty quick on my on my MacBook here. Um, and then when I have the data in the, uh, in the database, then I can start working with, with it. If you look at the steps again, 
uh, involved into getting the data into a database. You already said, okay, first of all, we have to get the documents from somewhere, so we need a leak or an investigation that gets us the documents. We have to classify them, do the OCR and the metadata extraction, and then we should actually take a step back and say, okay, what do we actually want to do with this data, right? What kind of information do we want to extract from the data? What kind of entities and uh, properties and attributes and relationships do we actually need to express what we want to ask? And so we grab a whiteboard, we grab our kind of journalist colleagues and tr uh, start to draw uh, the question on the whiteboard. And so we see kind of what uh, entities we could need. And after that, we have to do, of course, the entity extraction out of the, of the raw data using uh, named entity recognition or analysis and parsers, and then we store it in the database. And um, then we can actually start to inferring relationships. So even relationships that are not there in the first place, by looking at transitive things, we could also say, okay, this person owns uh, a, a share in this company, uh, which is related to this other company, and this other company uh, belongs to this other person, which um, um, is, um, let's say, from the same country and, as this person, so we can actually create a relationship between the two people that are both from the same country and have investments in the same set of companies, for instance. And it was kind of funny when, uh, when Mark Cabra, the data editor of the ICHA uh, unit for the Panama Papers said, um, her journalist said, it's like magic, right? Because I have originally all this data, which I, it's just like gigantic stacks of files, right? But then if you kind of add these relationships, then suddenly the stories emerge. And especially is if, um, if you look not just at one piece of data, but if you look at the neighborhood. So what else is around this company? What else is around this person? And also, if you look at, like, I have a company here, I have a company over there, are there kind of some paths that connect these two companies, right? And who is between the two, right? Who are all the intermediaries in between? And the most interesting thing was uh, that I said, whenever one journalist worked on the data and added new relationships and new information, then for another journalist on the other side of the, of the globe, actually, new stor stories could emerge, right? So because just by connecting two disparate kind of subsets of the data with one relationship on kind of they are pulled together and then suddenly if you look at the data again or query the data again, they belong together and suddenly you have your story, right? And actually it was a colleague that added the missing link to say so, which is really, really impre impressive. And the other thing which is really cool is that you can take an, any number of other sources, um, like census databases, uh, like top list from Forbes, you can use corporate registries in those countries where they are public and, and so on private investigation lists, so there's also things like um, uh, uh, ban lists, so uh, for instance, countries that ban uh, trade with other countries, and, and all, this, all this other information. So there are some uh, journalists who have like large stashes of all these kind of lists of things that are um, available or not available, depending. And they can pull this all in and connect it to the data because as soon as you have one connection point between the new data set and your existing data set, you can pull it together and then your kind of ability of, of cross-referencing this data uh, increases a lot. If you look at the data, um, you can actually extract a lot of entities directly from the data model, so something like documents and, and emails, but you can also get uh, metadata information, like this is a source, this is an, is an author. You can do the sender receiver for looking at message flows, for instance. Uh, you can also find money flows if you transitively look at which companies were created and then dissolved, and the money from this company went into this other company. That's also a way of moving money from A to B to C. Right? And then the actual entities, which are the people and companies involved, uh, like uh, owners and representatives, addresses, and so on. So th these are kind of entities, and the same kind of uh, reasoning you can do about relationships. But that seems uh, kind of natural uh, to someone who has worked for a while with graphs. But for the journalists, they chose a much more, a much simpler model. For them, it wa this model was good enough to doing all their research. So we have actually a client or an intermediary, which is the uh, law firm, which creates the, the shell companies. Uh, we have the actual shell companies, which are also called entities. We have an officer, which is a person who has any kind of role. So it could be a director, shareholder, beneficiary, assistant director, whatever, right? So, and uh, then um, they correlate uh, these officers uh, also to each other. Uh, because they have a lot of du duplicate data in the databases, because you have things like misspellings, typos, aliases, and so on. And actually, they intentionally didn't want to um, 
fiddle with the data, don't want to change the data because uh, in case they were sued, that they could always say, okay, this is the original data, we didn't uh, mess with it. Uh, the only thing that we did, we added additional information to it. Right? So that, that's why there's a lot of duplicate data in these records as well. So the data model uh, in the database, uh, the simple data model in the database looks like this. So the entity is the company, officer is the person, address is the address, and intermediary is the law firm. But the real data model really looks like this. So they did the, uh, they made a choice to actually put all the, um, uh, the information about which role did a person have with regard to a company on the relationship name, uh, which is probably something you wouldn't do in the first place, but that's what they chose to do, at least in the exported data. So you can only reason from the data that was made available from the ICIJ and not from what they used internally because they also didn't publish a lot of data. Um, because on the, uh, for instance, on the person records, there were things like passport numbers and, and stuff like that, email, personal email addresses, and so on. So they only published a really small subset in terms of number of attributes, of, uh, especially of the person records. Um, uh, but it's still interesting. And so they used this really simple data model. And when I first saw that, I thought, why did they use such a simple data model? I mean, there's so much uh, more uh, in there, like all the metadata and so on. But that's what we got. And um, so what they did uh, in, in several steps, first they kind of published these visualizations that you could kind of interact with, like 10 of those on, on their site, uh, which kind of highlighted some of the kind of most influential figures that they found. Um, here's an example of the um, Azerbaijanian presidential family, which is very involved in a lot of stuff. Uh, then in the next step, they published the database. Uh, which you can uh, query directly, so you can go to uh, uh, offshoreleaks.icij.org and then you can search yourself, And um, which uh, is also backed by, by Linkurious and Neo4j. And then uh, they actually started to publish the data itself, so the CSV files, but also the uh, Neo4j database with, with the data itself. And that's what we want to uh, look into now. So I downloaded it, you can uh, run it on any platform, and then uh, if you run the server, it looks li something like this. Uh, so Neo4j's uh, web UI is an Angular app, uh, so the database runs in the background like any database would do, uh, but when we uh, started to um, do the tour release of Neo4j, we thought we want to have a really nice interface for the developers to work with, so uh, we built this Angular app to interact with the database. And one of the cool features of this um, uh, user interface is that you can create your own kind of HTML slideshows as part of the, uh, uh, as part of the um, UI. And then you can use this, the, the, the slideshows to kind of convey information, uh, but also have uh, kind of embedded queries that you can run directly and see the results of. And that's what the ICIJ also used to, uh, to make this data available. So here we have the video that we've already seen. Then they also published data about uh, the um, data model, which you already looked into. But then they also said, OK, let's, uh, let's uh, publish some, some queries. And this is a query which takes uh, two pairs of really generic names, which return a cross product of 50,000 uh, pairs, and then um, runs the shortest path on these. And if I kind of make this a bit bigger, then I can see, OK, here we have um, the green ones are the people. And then we see uh, these are the entities between them. That, that result out of that. Right? So we can see, okay, who's in the middle between these two people, and there's a, one of the uh, law firms that creates these, um, these shell companies. And um, so this is kind of one way of how we can visually interact with the data. We can also say, okay, now I want to see, I want to double click here and, and, and dive into this and see what else is hanging on these, uh, on these nodes. So I can also just, as a, as a user, interactively explore the data, but I usually when I build an application or a um, investigative application on top of that, I would kind of use queries to achieve the same, uh, the, the same thing. Right. The other thing that you can also run on, on the data is um, more uh, statistic queries where you say, okay, I take all the clients of Mossack Fonseca and, um, what did the query say? And uh, want to see by country, where did they uh, found the shell companies, right? So the Bahamas are now top on the list because of Bahamas leaks, 16,000, and then it goes uh, further to Virgin Islands, Panama, Seychelles, 
and so on. So we see kind of also kind of these kind of statistic data which I, which I then can put into, into charts like the journalists did as well on their site. And uh, the other thing that is really nice is that they also published a set of like investigative queries. So really kind of deeply uh, uh, queries that uh, deeply drill down into, uh, into the data. So I don't want to go into all of these. I have um, a few. So one which is kind of fun uh, is to just look at the metadata of, of this uh, information. So I have here, as I said, the entity and the officer. And here you can also see really nicely kind of the gigantic amount of uh, relationship types that they put in between the two. So and this is actually from the database now. And then we have uh, the law firm, which has some more. And the blue one is the address node, which is also connected to all of them. Right. So that's also a really good way of quickly getting an overview of the data that you have in your, in your database. Uh, but the other things uh, that you can do is, for instance, to see uh, we put in like a name, uh, like I showed you the uh, the um, Azerbaijanian presidential family. And what I can do now with this query actually is to say, uh, let me make this a bit bigger. Um, I follow these patterns, right? So I say I find an officer uh, where somewhere the name is Aliyev, uh, which is kind of the uh, surname of the of the family. And then I follow from this officer to an entity, and from this entity to the next officer, and again to an entity. So it's a uh, one, two, three hop path, which would be the equivalent of, of six joints in a, in a SQL statement. And so I can uh, use that to actually um, explore the neighborhood uh, of my, uh, of my uh, people that I'm looking at, or of this family I'm looking at. And here I can see actually that uh, here we have uh, the two sisters which who jointly in, invest into companies. Uh, here are duplicates of these sisters. Uh, there's the mother as well. And here's uh, another thing that's in their name. So we see really kind of between those few people, if I pass in a few people, what is the network of, network of companies that they jointly invest on and use to transfer for, for money from A to B, right? I can also do this for, for other uh, People, for instance, if I put uh, something like, um, let's see, uh, Watson in here, then I should see, uh, uh, let's see, somewhere is uh, someone like Emma Watson. Uh, where is she? Yeah, like Left, right? Yeah. Frederick, here, yeah. right? So, and here we see also that she's listed under two names. So, one is her. Um, name as we know it, and then here's another name as a beneficiary, and here we have the, uh, the address where, the, uh, where she's registered, and here we have the address where the uh, company is registered, and the trust that they used. So you can really kind of use that as a journalist to say, okay, I have this person or this group of people that I want to investigate, and I start at this point, and I kind of uh, find my way uh, towards uh, what else is involved in that. And I can also use it... Um, uh, to do uh, something like, like this, which is a more involved query. So we let it run for a little bit, which is joint involvement. So that means I have two people being involved with companies or two, two entities being involved with companies and not just once, but multiple times. So we have the sa same pair of, of people time and again being uh, invested in the same companies or being shareholders or being directors of the same companies. And the more frequently this happens, uh, the more there's an indication that between the two people, it's not just an accident that they kind of have shareholdership in, in, two com uh, in, in the same company, but it's a recurring thing, so we see that there's actually uh, more to it. And here, um, the top ones are actually uh, all artificial kind of uh, officers which kind of jointly invest, so we have up to 1,300 joint investments into the same company, so it's much more than just an incident, right? Um, it's similar to addresses, right? So because for the shell companies, you have these mailing box addresses, so you have sometimes one address where 10,000 companies are, or 1,000 companies are registered to the same address, right? So it's something that you should actually see, for instance, if you are a corporate registry uh, in a country and you see that 1,000 companies are to registered to the same address, there has to be something off, right? It's because it's physically impossible for, even to, for them to even receive the mail. So we could... Um, if we wanted to, we could filter, uh, filter that out as well. And then we can also do shortest paths, so we could uh, say, okay, 
uh, I don't know, uh, between uh, two people, Gun, Logson, and Cameron, or something like that. I don't know if I spelled the ex Icelandic prime minister correctly. No, probably not. So you can find, uh, try to find, uh, um, for instance, if you have something with Copenhagen and we have something with, let's say, uh, with UK in the name, then we also don't find something. Okay. But you, you saw it before with, with Smith and Grant. So, uh, but usually you, you know what you're looking for. Then you can also look for uh, geo information. Uh, like um, I'm looking for um, things in Barcelona. And then I see all the addresses in, in Barcelona. And then can, can, can do look uh, into the geolocation. So for instance, if I have people from a certain country or a certain city being in, involved into something, then I can investigate that. And I can also do something like this, where I say, OK, I have um, actually a geo search. But then this gives me only the starting points. But then what I look at is actually kind of the second or the third degree neighborhood of these addresses, who was involved in, in that. And then I can run this. And then here, I even aggregate the data and see what are the most, um, most popular intermediaries. That means. Uh, um, law firms or banks. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, information, or there are a lot of international banks like UBS or Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse involved, or branches of them are involved in creating these shell companies because someone has to be like the banking uh, responsibility or keep the or HSPC as well, right? Uh, has to have the banking responsibility for those. Uh, so uh, you see uh, with this also that you can filter out these kinds of things. You can also can do a full text search, for instance, if I had just read this article in the, um, in the Herald, I can also say, find me Nelly Gross, and here she is, uh, unexpectedly in Bahamas Leagues, and here we see her, her company, and here we see the law firm that created the company, so which created a lot of other companies as well, and then we see that one of her friends is also jointly uh, director of this company, and here we see the addresses of both, and uh, so that's kind of how you can uh, quickly find the relationships between things, right? So and then you can see, okay, do they also have other uh, joint activities, for instance, in the political scene or in the in the in the business scene as well, right? So you can kind of transfer these patterns or these relationships between people that you find here via the shell companies, and then look for in politics or in the business world, do they also have any kind of joint uh, operations? Uh, on uh, other joint involvements and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, things. We can also do uh, graph algorithms on the data. Um, for instance, we can say, let's find um, a, uh, the most uh, influential law firms. So we can run a page rank on this. Uh, let's see how long it takes. So you can get this data directly from the ICIJ. Um, you can download the database here on, on their site. Uh, and then start it locally. Here's the Bahama Papers thing. And um, it's also quite simple to, to build an application on top of that. So this is something my, some of my colleagues built. They just used um, Angular, uh, D3, and Sigma uh, together with this ICIJ database uh, running on Neo4j, and they connected it to Open Corporates, which is an uh, also open uh, corporate registry. So for instance, I can... Uh, uh, search for, an, for a company, and then it goes and finds, hopefully it finds, uh, what did I have last, last time, uh, Melbourne. Let's see, what was this, Melbourne? Or was no. uh, this. Uh, let's see. Demo effect, so the demo goes still not. Uh, Pong. I had one that was kind of had four connections, but I didn't keep it around. Open in Rodania. Yeah, so you can kind of connect the data from the, uh, the green one is from, uh, from the Panama Papers, and the red one is from, um, you should probably switch such something in Copenhagen, right? Copenhagen, 
آره اصلا نفع میکنه به بدل دنمارک دنمارک هالینگز لیمیتد سوری ا تو انتریز فور دنمارک هالینگز لیمیتد ان بات از ایت اکچولی ان ان نیویورک انٹرسٹنگلی اوکی اینڈ ہیئر سو دی کوئی وف دی دی پیچرنگ از بیک سو وی ہیو دیز انٹرمیڈیا سو دیز کمپنیز ہیو دی ہائیسٹ پیچرنگ سو دی ار اکورنگ موسٹ فریکوینٹلی آن دی آن دی پاس تھرو دی نیٹ ورک سو آئی کین آلسو رن پیچرنگ اور ادر گراف آپریشنز آن ٹاپ آف دس ڈیٹا اوکی لیٹ می لک ات دی ٹائم سو ایس 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 بیفور وی کین کنیکٹ دس انفرمیشن تو ادر لس and um, from, from all the other things, but also use social media uh, to pull in more information about the, the neighborhoods of the people that we're looking at, right? Uh, social media is also used by other journalists, so currently there's a lot of stuff going on um, with, of course, US elections investigations. Before that, there was a lot of investigations of social media like Twitter on uh, Brexit, for instance, or on, uh, so the Süddeutsche Zeitung just published an article yesterday or the day before um, analyzing the tweets around the uh, terror attacks in, in Munich, uh, where there were several, uh, um, uh, or there was one attack, but there were a lot of tweets about other places where there are allegedly were attacks in the same night. And so they looked at kind of at how the Twitter data represented kind of the local panic in the different areas, and it was kind of really interesting uh, to look at it. Uh, if you want to make this data available to non-developers, it's actually pretty nice to give them a kind of a visual tool to do that, so they, they don't have to write the queries themselves. So either you do something where you only like fill in the blanks like I had here, where I only have like a text field, I can fill in the name, run the query and get the results, or you build like a tiny app uh, for doing that. So something I, um, I just thought of this morning um, is to put them on a map. Well, I didn't think about it, but I didn't have time before to do it, so I just did it this morning really quickly. So I just stole a Mapbox uh, demo and uh, did the following. Uh, I used uh, Neo4j, uh, Google's uh, geocoder, and uh, used the JavaScript driver for Neo4j and uh, Mapbox, and uh, put it also in GitHub. And this is an example of how we can put the data from, from Denmark on a map uh, in Mapbox. Um, so I just, uh, first of all, I ran a query that geocodes the addresses, so I find all the addresses that are in Denmark, and then I just call a uh, Neo4j procedure to geocode the address, and then I just set the location, so latitude, longitude, and description on the, on the address node, and then later on in the, in the actual app, I can say, okay, find me an address in, in Denmark that also has an uh, entry for longitude, where the distance to a point I give from, from the outside is less than uh, X kilometers, and find me not just the address, but also the, the officer that is connected to this address, and also the entities that they have any uh, roles to. And then we return the officer's name, the entity's name, which is the company name, the role is kind of director, shareholder, beneficiary, something like that, the address itself, the country of the entity as well, and then put this on, on a map. And if I, if I look on this, uh, so I just run it locally here. So this Copenhagen, as you can see, and if I click on this here, I get all the uh, map entries. So fortunately for Denmark, there are only 64 addresses in the whole data set, so you seem to be a pretty clean country. And if I hover over one of these, then um, I can see, uh, it doesn't get bigger, the tooltip. So this is a, a the officer is Birgir Bierwelt, a uh, shareholder of this company, which is located in Luxembourg. It's called Dagen, Dagen, uh, come on, tooltips. Yeah? All oh, right, so here we are, right? So um, Mr. Volodymyr Potatov is shareholder of a company which is called um, which is in Chechenia, I think. It's called Fingel Holding, and it's Center Boulevard number five <laughs> um, in Copenhagen. So it's right in this location, right? So we could, should go and find this company, <laughs> which is registered here. So which is just here, right? Just around the corner. So you can see, you can easily make this data available as, a, uh, uh, as an interactive app. 
And then you could say, okay, I have the map here, and I click on one, and then I see kind of an overlay of a graph visualization over the map and stuff like that. So you can easily imagine that you can build uh, other apps on top of that. Um, but um, there are also some other really cool ways of, of doing this kind of interactive graph search. One you've already seen, which is the Linkurious uh, JavaScript app, which is also available for free as uh, Linkurious JS uh, uh, library. But something else that someone in, in France, uh, Frederic, uh, built is called Popoto.js, which uses the metadata of the graph to search. So you wouldn't search on the kind of individual entities, but you would search on officers and entities and intermediaries, but then you can drill down and select an in individual one, which would then restrict the total amount of um, things. And especially with all these different relationships, you would have like a, a rich structure to search on, so you could only follow like shareholders, or you could only follow beneficiaries from entities, and then drill down, and then select one, and then it will, will reduce the total set, which is really nice, because what he does is he turns this visual kind of by example search into a natural language text. I'm looking for X, Y, C, and then uh, you get the results here, but you can also see the cipher query that he actually generates which is really nice. And it can be also run as a part of Neo4j. Something else a colleague of mine built was um, Visual Search Bar, Visual Search DS, where you have kind of this structured query thing, like you have, for instance, in um, a new track from JetBrains, where you have a structural search, or in Jira today, uh, where you have a structural search over the over the data, not as a free form, but you always get, I'm looking for this attribute with this value, and then it restricts automatically what else could they look for by um, applying this first search and then restricting the data uh, down to that. And the, last, the other thing that he built, uh, my colleague Max, was also taking natural language and a uh, Ruby gem to do like uh, SPO, subject, predicate, object uh, processing, and turned these patterns of, of language directly into graph patterns and ran then the graph query uh, from that as well. So this is something you can do on top of such a data set like the Panama Papers to make it available to non non-technical people like, like journalists, right? Or medical researchers or uh, other NGOs and so on. Um, so I'll quickly go over these, these last things because what I want to show you, um, uh, only for this slide, it really depends on what kind of data you have that determines which database you use, right? Because this is really highly connected data, you would, you, you would use a graph database, but it doesn't say it's a silver bullet for, for everything, so I, uh, make your own mind and uh, make an informed decision. So people will like it. And question is, what will you bring together, right? Uh, you can put a conference schedule with all the rooms, the speakers, the sessions, the ratings, and, and so on into a graph, which is actually uh, living in a graph uh, for GoToCon in, in Neo4j. So your, your ratings go to, into a Neo4j as well. Um, you can put social media into a graph. You can put... Um, genealogy in, into a graph, you can put in corporate information, you can do, put scientific information together, and then you have a much better time and uh, much nicer time querying and working with this data, I think, at least. Like, there's a lot of stuff to learn that you can uh, use uh, from online courses to books and so on. And I actually uh, went to the bookstore and he said, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have the book. Uh, I lost several boxes of books on, on my way but I give you a 25% discount and ho free home delivery. So if you want to um, have a look at the graph database, this book, I only have one copy here, but the guy at the book source said he can all get you any number. And I'm giving away one of the Panama paper books for the first question that comes along. <laughs> so, so this is from the original um, journalists that were contacted by John Doe, and it's, a really, uh, it's like, a, like a crime story almost uh, to read. And if you are a journalist or know a journalist who would, would kind of benefit from something like that, we also started a journalist program to support journalists and other people who investigate uh, data. More information, and then that's it from me. Please rate, and looking forward to your questions. We have one minute for questions, and um, I think the winner will be the question I select here. So uh, have you looked into AI deep learning to analyze the data and discover new relationships or even identify suspicious uh, things, activity? Yeah, uh, so for, for the, this question, if you looked into deep learning AI and machine learning and so on, uh, we haven't, uh, but um, it's not so much us. Uh, so the 
Journalists even didn't tell us that they were using Neo4j for the whole year until they were ready to publish the data. Right? So we couldn't even help them. We also would love to help them, also playing like um, graph algorithms or predictive algorithms on, on top of the data, but they just didn't tell anyone. So we couldn't even help them back then. But now they are building a new platform for the ICIJ for this kind of investigation for other journalists as well. And this will include also algorithms like that. So they will apply, for instance, named entity recognition on top of the data. They will try to find uh, relationships, uh, predict relationships with machine learning algorithms and so on. So it's definitely on their radar, but I think they were excited and happy that they made it at all, uh, kind of to get information out of this gigantic amount of data. And so I think what came out of this was is already pretty impressive. And for the next years that come, we'll see a lot of uh, more things there. Okay. Okay, we take one more. How did you avoid uh, data pollution when doing collaboration? Like when a journalist uh, put some uh, error or wrong uh, relation into the database? Uh, data uh, pollution is actually something that you would also want to look for when you infer relationships. So because you only can say, okay, these two entities or these two people are actually the same person with a certain probability. And so that's what you would store in a relationship. You would pr pr uh, store a confidence or a probability on a relationship that this fact is actually true. And that's what you could do also with the, um, with the data that comes in from the journalists themselves. You could say, okay, initially when the relationship is first created, it gets like a very low confidence score. But then if other journalists, for instance, confirm the data, then I inc can increase the confidence score until it's uh, at a certain threshold where I could say, okay, this is a fact because it has been confirmed from three independent people and not using the same sources, for instance, and then you, you um, solve something like that. Okay, thanks okay. a lot. So, yeah, remember to rate the session and uh, thank you, Mike. You're welcome.